that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. It is September 10th at 6.33 p.m. calling to order this monthly meeting of the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee. Um, regular chair Ann Hovey is not with us tonight. She sends her regards and her regrets. Um, today was her day this afternoon to drop off her first and only child at college. And that has been successfully completed, and she is en route back to Massachusetts, and we'll be back in action next week. Um, so before we get started on our agenda, do we have any community comments? Yes, Judy Miller. Yes, I'm speaking as a member of the community and not as a member of the school board. Um, to let everyone know that we had a wildly successful uh, summer drama program. We had 30 students a grades going into grades 6 through 12, and we had, I believe, five students who were either recently graduated like this year or in the last two or three years who were student directors. It was a dinner theater. We had four sold-out shows, and um, it was really fun. Uh, the kids had a great time. They learned a lot, and uh, it was good community building. and. Good theater, too. Well, thank, thank you. you. Great. Any further community comments? Hearing none, we are moving forward to reports. Um, and the first report is um, Ms. McCoy. Sure. Um, so I um, hope that you had a chance to review my report. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, a lot of things are intertwined, and I would like to ask if I might have the opportunity to revisit a topic that we didn't have a chance to touch upon in our June meeting, which is the Portrait of Graduate. Um, there was a lot of work done last spring, um, and the visual was worked on over the summer, and in order to start sharing it officially with the community, I would love to get your input and your feedback and your um, endorsement so that we can continue to move forward in the process. Would it be okay if I... Certainly. Are you looking for our endorsement tonight? No. Okay. And the, and that's something we can yeah. discuss too, if, if and how that might happen. Absolutely. I mean, basically, the the innovation committee work has kind of started with the um, strategic plan and developed out of that goal and has met several times. I think you're on it, and um, along with 60 some odd other people. And there's just been a lot of work going on that really the school committees need to be brought up to speed with because they've brought it this whole thing to kind of these competencies that we think make up the portrait of, of a graduate for Dover Sherburn. And the, the, the challenge is that in some systems, they will use this as their strategic plan moving forward, essentially. These competencies are the things that we will work on as a district. We did the strategic plan, and out of the strategic plan developed our portrait of a graduate. You guys voted to approve the, the um, strategic plan, so I don't know that you necessarily have to vote to approve the portrait of a graduate, but that's what we wanted to. Well, Beth kind of wanted to bring people up to speed on where we are, show, the, show all of you what the competencies were, how they came to be quickly, as quickly as possible, and, but you can't really short shrift it too much because it's hugely important. And then um, if necessary, we can bring it back to, to the joint committees as well. Okay. So that's kind of so, where we're yeah. at. Okay. So I would, if, if possible, yeah. I'd like to use yeah. my time to discuss the portrait Certainly. of graduate, which is also highlighted in my report. So I have a timeline for you. Um, as teachers, we all know that if I give you the timeline, I, I might lose your attention. So I'll, okay. maybe I'll talk through it. Um, and you can take notes if you'd like or whatever works for your learning style. So as Andrew just mentioned, he started with um, the strategic plan through his entry process, mm -hmm. and he and I and other members um, of the team met with all constituency um, stakeholder groups from parents and community members to school committee, um, teachers, administrators, students, uh, and gained their ideas of what we were doing successfully as a community and where we might potentially grow. Um, from that, he developed um, with everyone's support, the strategic plan, um, which included a bucket called Innovative Teaching and Learning, which I have the privilege of working with, um, given my, my title and background. 
So under the innovative teaching and learning bucket, um, the goal was to maintain excellence and rigor, which we know Dover and Sherbourne are known for, um, while also adapting best practices and programs to prepare graduates for success in a rapidly changing world. So as you can see spelled out here, in the action steps of the strategic plan, there are a number of initiatives that we were given the go-ahead by the school committee to take it and take your three to five years and start to work on them. Um, so anything from developing the portrait of a graduate to um, working with um, institutes of higher education for partnerships and professional development opportunities, um, more sharing within the district with each other so that we can learn elementary to high school, high school teachers to high school teachers about what we're doing, um, providing professional development opportunities uh, around technology and making sure that our students are maintaining the digital literacy they need in this evolving world, um, PD opportunities that emphasize student-centered instructional practice and self-driven independent learning, um, authentic assessment and using formative data to give students constant feedback, um, ensuring that our experiences are horizontally and vertically aligned and emphasize creativity, innovation, critical thinking, design thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, and global competency, um, integrating some social justice and social emotional wellness standards, um, and of course, very importantly, um, continuing to explore um, cultural responsiveness and the impact of race and identity in all of this work. So this is a long list. It is quite heavy and quite thick, and it came from all of the stakeholders in the community. So even though it might fall to me to help lead this work under Andrew's um, leadership, it made sense to involve the community in rolling this out, and how do we do that? Um, so hence, we brought together the Academic Innovation Committee, because although I would love to have all 7,000 community members involved, um, that is impossible. So in October, um, 2018, I should say, um, I had reached out to all stakeholder groups, again, students, parents, um, teachers, community members, and asked if anybody would be interested in helping to dive into this work and, and figure out how to start making these things happen. Um, and we had lots of interest. In fact, we had over 60 people respond with interest. Um, I had to balance out the groups to make sure that student teachers had a good representation because they're the ones that do the work as well as parents. So unfortunately, I did end up turning a few folks away who were able to um, move in again later. But the committee at the end of the day ended up being 57 people representing all stakeholder groups. Um, and so on the bottom of this sheet, you'll see that we came together for a number of meetings over several hours and days. Um, we had our first meeting in January where we framed the work and we developed our essential question, which is, if the goal under the innovative teaching and learning bucket is to maintain excellence and rigor while adapting our programs and practices, what do our graduates need for success in college, career, and life? So we really needed to dig into what does college, career, and life look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, so we can start planning backward from there. Um, so that was the first meeting, uh, framing the work. We had an opportunity to talk to Tony Wagner from Harvard, um, who provided us his take on the seven survival skills. So we said, thank you. We'll put those in the possibility bucket. Um, he also talked about five contradictions in American education, some of which apply to Dover Sherburn and some don't. He um, kind of warned us about um, the negative effects of a focus on individual achievement, siloed distinct disciplines, teacher-directed learning, um, penalizing students with F's for failure, um, and using external motivation, like grades and awards, to get students activated. So we put that into our research tank and said thank you. Um, we then had screenings of Most Likely to Succeed, um, the documentary as well as Beyond Measure, which are available online if you'd like to view them as well. Um, we then brought together an industry think tank panel discussion. So this is where we dug into what do our graduates need for success in career. Um, so we had eight of our own community members come and talk to us about the skills that they needed for their job 10 years ago, their jobs now, and what they foresee the skills being um, in their fields um, in the future for our kiddos. Um, we had people from um, the legal world, Fidelity Investments, um, global education, um, linguistics, um, innovation and technology, the Army, um, healthcare, um, et cetera. And they had several important messages for us about the importance of communication, continual growth and learning, um, success as an iterative process of not giving up and continuing to go back and refine, um, the ability to see the world through an interdisciplinary lens, um, and the importance of field experience, mentoring, internships, and service learning. So that was our takeaway. 
Um, we had the College in the 21st Century panel to address the what are graduates need for college components. Um, we had, again, eight panelists, half of whom are the college folks that our guidance department works with um, from various schools as we are placing students and, and going through the admissions process. Uh, the other four are actually members of our community who either teach in college or serve on an admissions panel. So we had Harvard Medical School, UMass Amherst, Boston University, Tufts University, Worcester State, BC, Babson, um, and Johnson & Wales. So it was kind of a, a, the gamut of big, small, urban, suburban, um, and they provided us some insights into what our kids would need for success in college, um, capstone projects, independent um, learning opportunities, service learning, um, that there's a slow movement towards standards-based transcripts and competency profiles um, for admissions, slow movement, um, an expansion even at the post-secondary level um, of interdisciplinary programs and how a lot of colleges are now, instead of just having the English building and the math building, are having interdisciplinary or innovative building. Um, so that was insightful. We've read lots of books and articles. Of course, we jigsawed those to get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, at our meeting in April, we came together and said, OK, we've done a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of listening. Let's synthesize the key messages, which we did. And then let's come up with a list of key competencies we think our students would need. Um, so we had tables of eight um, in uh, mixed groups, students, parents, teachers together. Um, kind of listing their competencies and then using sticky notes to um, to kind of rank them based on their input. Uh, then we brought them all together and came up with a list of 15 potential competencies that we thought were um, kind of capturing what we had learned in our research. At that same meeting, we also said, what would our portrait look like? We had looked at samples of the portrait of a graduate from other districts and said, well, we want something that represents Joe Burke and Sherburn uh, in our community. So we started with each individual person drawing a portrait of the, what they would recommend the portrait look like. Then each table came together and took the eight portraits, created one that represented their table. And at the end of that meeting, we had eight to chew on and think about over the next month. So when we came together in May, um, we were able to narrow down the list of competencies um, as well as kind of synthesize all of the eight portraits into one that we thought represented all 60 people's ideas. Um, I should note that in between there, from the April meeting to the May meeting, um, we had taken the list of 15 potential competencies and reached out to all community members. Um, students in grades 6 through 12 all got an email saying, here's where the work we've been doing, here are the competencies, please prioritize your top five. Um, we did that with parents pre-K through 12, um, and obviously teachers too pre-K through 12. And so when we came together in May at our final Academic Innovation Committee meeting, we took all that data, we sorted it by parents, teachers, students. There were some interesting trends in how students ranked um, competencies versus teachers versus parents. So we took all that to effect. Obviously, there were stakeholders from all of those groups in the in the audience. We were able to kind of process that. And we came up with a list of final six, as well as a proposed portrait. Um, from that meeting, I went to Darren Buck, who is a teacher at the high school, um, who's also very talented with graphic design, and said, here are our ideas. See if you can work your magic. So he took off and started working with our graphic for the portrait of graduate. In the meantime, um, the members of the Academic Innovation Committee um, teachers presented all of this process and work to their faculties in June. I was able to present it to the school committees along with my administrative counterparts at Dover and Sherburne. Unfortunately, we just got too busy here. Um, and then we came back from the summer, having had the opportunity for the leadership team to travel to Finland um, and kind of look at the international scope of education. Um, we brought together 65 teachers in August to do some envisioning of DS. So if these are the six competencies we believe our graduates need, what are we already doing well? How do we celebrate those things? How do we share those things with each other? And where can we grow? Um, the 65 people was a great turnout. Um, 28 of them were from the high school, which was very impressive. Um, the feedback I shared with you in the report was all very positive. I didn't just pick the positive thing either. There was very little negative, but people didn't take the time to put it in there. Um, and so that kind of got the conversation going to the next level. So it's not just within the Academic Innovation Committee, but now it's kind of coming down to the school level and the teacher level um, throughout the district to say, how do we take this portrait of a graduate or these competencies and start bringing it to life? Um, and that's where we are right now. So I have a potential visual of the portrait of a graduate and the proposed competencies that I would like to share with you um, and getting your feedback and what your thoughts are on next steps. 
um, before we actually go official public with it and share it with parents and put it in the hands of teachers and students to start posting. So, drum roll, anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So while, while those are going around, this is uh, this has really been a, a huge, huge undertaking. Yeah. To think that this was going on kind of alongside all of our other work last year um, is impressive to say the least. And um, really, we've entrusted Beth and this team to really take a deep look at what it is we're all about and who we want to be and really be thoughtful and make sure that everyone's had a chance to weigh in. And this is what they've come up with. But again, the question for me, and really for you, is whether or not this is something that you think, as the regional committee, think needs to be kind of a, a voted on and approved by the joint committees or not. It's not a, it's not a um, uh, kind of a revamping of our curriculum. It's right. rather just highlighting these competencies that we hope our teachers will constantly and our administrators and all of us will keep on our um, radar. We don't want this to go into a cabinet somewhere. And that's that's why I'm putting that to you. I do feel like it's already kind of approved as part of the strategic plan, but if you feel that that's something that needs to come forward to the joint school committee, I mean, obviously, we'll put this to the Dover and Sherbourne school committees as well. But if you think that that's something you'd like us to do to kind of uh, formally kind of sanction it, um, that would be great. But um, I'm going to let Beth talk about how they came up with this portrait. Sure. So you'll see the six competencies um, around the outer edge. They are defined um, by the Academic Innovation Committee on the back. Um, Maggie was there and can contest to the amount of discussion there was around nouns, verbs, and kind of how to capture the main ideas within these competencies. So this is our best go at it at this point. And obviously from here, um, we would be creating rubrics down the road that our teachers um, and educators would weigh in on to really define what these competencies mean. Um, but in the center, this is actually a tree um, from Sherburn that Darren traced the silhouette of. So it's one of our own. Um, and that represents obviously growth. Everything comes out of the roots and the foundation of the growth mindset that we all grow and flourish over time. And we you know, each take different amounts of time and effort to get to different places, but we're always continually growing and learning. Um, in the center of it all, you'll notice there is a heart carved in the tree with DS in the center. Obviously we love DS, but the heart really um, is supposed to symbolize empathy. Um, empathy did not make it into one of the categories because there was discussion about how do you teach it, how do you measure it, um, but we thought it was very important to make sure that our children are developing em empathy, so we put it smack dab in the middle, um, carved into the tree. You'll notice there's a child there. You're not supposed to be able to tell if it's male or female or what race or age um, reading a book, and this is supposed to represent a lifetime love of learning. Um, again, the growth mindset that we continue to learn and grow over time. Um, the tree from Sherburn, and similar to many trees in Dover um, <laughs> and Boston, um, is therefore in the forefront of the global piece. So we are you know, part of a global community and we need to kind of keep that in the back of our minds that even though we're loving and nourishing our children in this environment, that we need to prepare them for the world um, at large. So there was the thinking behind the portrait. Ideally, if this you know, is, is our portrait moving forward, I'm hoping that the communication committee can take this and perhaps um, do some of its branding with it for our, our letterhead, perhaps with the tree. I know the English department at the high school already adopted the tree as, as their Twitter picture. Um, not this tree, a tree. Right. Um, but lots of potential opportunities moving forward. It, it stay black and white? It could. We, we left it two colors, thinking it could be black and white, it could be royal and white, it could be navy and white. One, one of the things that I, I really like about in terms of the branding, whether or not the portrait becomes kind of, I think that's a bigger discussion if we were going to kind of move away from the DS or the, the town seals, that, that's definitely a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. But what I do like about that idea is this the competencies themselves. Um, when we met with um, the um, kind of the expert in the field, her name is oh, Maria Cadison. Yes, Maria Cadison, former school committee member, um, but also is in this is in this field of marketing, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. private schools. 
spoke to us directly about the idea of kind of capturing what your key <coughs> key phrases are that define your system and putting that out there for people. It's really important for, for people to come to our site and know what Dover Sherbin is all about. So this kind of, in my opinion, gets us closer to that um, place. So do our core values. So, I mean, that's a further discussion and the communication committee is, is it's gonna have its hands full with all of that. But it definitely gives us something to chew on. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I appreciate the hard work that went into this. So again, we're kind of looking for some some um, insights from the, the school committee. And definitely not a, we're not looking for any kind of action tonight, yeah. obviously. Um, I, I really very much appreciate your report. I appreciate it in the context of um, where it's sort of gone since June. So in that sense, while it was sad that we got so late at the end of the year. It's it's nice to come back with our new team and um, also understanding where the work went in the summer. Um, I appreciate understanding or hearing the feedback that the faculty, the faculty who participated in the summer thing were very positive. I, that was my question about the feedback you had in your packet was, is this just like the cherry picked or is this really how it was? So I, I trust and appreciate that the faculty was so unanimously or, or very much so supportive of the work that you've done. Um, I, while I don't, I agree that none of this is um, contrary to the current strategic plan and in that sense would not need like an official approval. I think that in terms of effective communication, mm -hmm. it would be fabulous if at a future joint school committee meeting, um, it would be, I, I mean, I would love it if we had some kind of community representation of this, whether it's students or a video or some faculty talking about it, and then we could have this sort of at the end, mm -hmm. um, whether it's like, I think a video comes to mind only because it would give you an opportunity for a lot more voices at the table and to see this in action. Um, you know, having been there when it was um, the drawing, mm -hmm. I, I love what's gone from drawing in June to graphic now. I think that's a real um, growth, literally. Um, an improvement of the iteration. So I, I don't know what other folks think. I, I, I have to say I'm wildly impressed with your energy and the, all the work that you've put in. And I am not someone who, I am someone who um, respects that process and respects the process of You've put a lot of work into it. I would never second guess you. I think that this looks um, great. I think it is really uh, excellent. And that's really all I wanted to say, which is nicely done, really nicely done. I'll, I'll echo that. Thank you. Um, I, uh, maybe one question, one suggestion. Um, I mean, it, it, it's. I think that the the uh, well maybe first comment is the you know you're reading off the uh, under the innovative teaching and learning the bullet points and um, probably by design you know that you have so many things in in all of these reports that really speak to this so, so these things are going on now which is wonderful you know this is forward looking but we're we're not waiting to get to the forward mm -hmm. there are things that are have actively been happening last year. They're happening this year, and it's it's really fabulous to, to see that. Um, question is whether you at all feel constrained, time constrained, um, enough time to kind of go as, as deep or explore some of the things as much as you would want, or do you feel like there was at any point you needed to, okay, we need to get to the end by no. June or? Um, I think, um, I appreciate the the, um, the comments and how much time and effort went into this. And yes, it was a big process with a lot of people involved and a lot of synthesis with all of those people. Um, but this is just a map moving forward. And I didn't get into the next step part of the timeline, which you're welcome to you know read on your own. And we can process it at a later date, myself and other members of the Academic Innovation Committee, if you'd like. Um, but this is just the beginning. Um, and to your point, um, you know, I think that there are bite-sized pieces kind of like the sand is moving right now you know we have um, this year is all about celebrating what we already do we have newsletters both at the school level um, and the district level that are highlighting some of the work that supports us our professional development day in december 
our full day after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving is all about sharing. So it's our own teachers sharing the work that's already happening in the district. So others can say, oh, I'm going to steal that idea and do it tomorrow. Um, we have the furniture grant that we got from DSCF, which has been wildly popular and um, has just kind of got this energy going pre-K through 12. And even teachers who didn't get the grant are buying and changing their rooms on their own, which is great. Um, you know, so I think the sand is moving. We've got some kind of like pebbles, I'm calling them, that are starting to be processed. Um, within committee work, there's talk about perhaps some standardized or standards-based grading in some classes at the middle school. You know, adding this, the computer science course at the high school, you know, whether um, the elective course at the high school should finally be at the table for some weight in their GPA. These are kind of the middle level pebbles. And then there's some boulders that it's going to take a long time for everybody to weigh in on whether or not we want to start to touch things like graduation requirements, the final transcript, um, schedules, um, interdisciplinary courses, those sorts of things. And so those need some time to cook and really process with a lot of buy in. So. Um, I, I would love to say that you know tomorrow we're going to wake up and this is going to be fully implemented, but I think we need to be respectful of the conversations and getting the buy-in along the way. So sure. we'll continue to work on the sand and the pebbles, and the boulders will come over time. Great. Uh, and a suggestion, um, perhaps if if out of this, um, maybe some of the 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 elements that went into it, uh, the things by so the, it, it'd be. Fascinating to have kind of the the narrative trail of so what did we learn from the from the secondary school leaders what did we learn from the industry leaders what were some of the the brilliant ideas that came out of the you know the the the, the educator brainstorming uh, and so those pieces are are accessible where somebody can you know look and see and read and feel and and incorporate that into what they do I, I find that sometimes. Just with the, the bullet points, um, it might not be as uh, uh, intuitive or clear. Okay, what do I do to, to fill, fulfill these things? What are some of the things that are behind that? Yeah, and so um, many of the lessons that were learned were in the Prezi that I'd hoped to show in June. So I'm happy to reshare that with you, and it's on the innovation website. But I guess the next step is depending on how much you feel like you need to weigh in on the actual portrait. My goal is to send this out to the larger community as well as you know a, a media press release um, with a story, which would basically be taking the timeline and adding a story to it. Um, so again, I didn't want to do that without having you take a first look at it. Um, but that's the next step, and I can obviously share you know some more of those lessons in, um, along in the narrative, um, and then just in, start to engage people in a deeper conversation of you know how to take it from the paper into. You know, actual and, life. And, and so this is kind of brings us full circle to where we were. So this is kind of my question, and it's it's actually for all of us. What is the best way for us to communicate the work that's been done and to educate people on the value of that work and the competencies that they came up with? And what does it mean to their children? I think that's what you're saying, Michael. Like, people need to understand when they look at this, like, what is it? And why? Mm -hmm. And why? Yeah. And if if our work is about, and I believe it is, especially uh, for the school leaders, is about communication and relationships, this is the communication piece, just as we encountered on the time, uh, the start time thing. <coughs> communication, everybody has to kind of really understand it deeply. And I, and I worry about that going out too soon without first explaining more about the competencies at the same time the comp Beth has actually put this stuff out there a lot it's just I don't know if people are hearing it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you do are you still doing your TV show yes it would be fabulous if in a fall TV show you could have a panel folks on the academic innovation committee a couple students some teachers maybe a teacher was skeptical who's now kind of come on board it would be fantastic if that's there could be idea. a roundtable yeah. panel that then would be on because that's something that you, you you can put out to the community people watch mm -hmm. it it's it, yeah. it would be um, a chance for folks to weigh in but for you to ask some questions and yeah. that sort of stuff we're also hoping to reach out um uh, last year, uh, Challenge Success sponsored the evening with the superintendent, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. theme of yeah. this year is going to be the portrait of a graduate, and we're right. hoping that many people will come, yep. um, you know, especially parents and community members. Teachers are hearing it through faculty meetings, and I'll soon be meeting with them at the department level and the um, you know, grade level, 
and students were hoping to get through student councils and, and town meetings and those sorts of things. I mean, I, I'm feeling personally, I'm feeling really good that there was a lot of weigh in on this and that's important. But at the same time, I guarantee you, if you asked, if you polled the general community, our general stakeholders, there'd be too many people who say, I don't know what it's about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we, 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 I feel like we have to double down on that. So maybe the TV shows, uh, mention of it in our um, newsletter, which we're shooting out this week. That's our target is Friday. So um, referencing it, I don't, I don't know that we necessarily have to put out the actual portrait itself mm -hmm. at this point, because I don't know if that is a distraction or not, but we can work on that. I, I think... Um... It's smart to start slowly because I think we've all been hearing a lot about this and I can just speak for myself, like I still have questions and I think people will say, well, we already have core values, why are we doing this now, how is this different, you know, starting from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And then the um, question I have is, and you did mention a little bit in here, but are these things that you're going to try to to measure somehow, not that I think everything has to be measured, but I know it's you talk about um, the leadership team identifying, class, doing, looking for things in classroom observations, but how do you, f I know it's down the road, it's at the end of your, I read it somewhere, putting it into action and how does it look in three years kind of thing. Right, so um, a couple of things. One is um, for a long time, the high school has had school-wide rubrics that many of them mirror these same adjectives. They haven't changed over time. And now it's really updating them and stretching them K through 12. So what does communication look like K through two, three through five, and creating rubrics that are more skills-based versus content-based. We have very good content ones. Um, and now it's, it's integrating the skills um, rubrics in there and making sure that the assessments that we're giving students, whether they're authentic assessments or traditional assessments, are measuring both content and skills. So we're, that's how we're going to measure it against students. You know, some schools who have been doing this work for years um, have students create a portfolio so that by the time they graduate from said high school, they have evidence that they have, you know, mastered all of these things. And in here, they can show you and talk about it in front of a panel or in front of parents to do that. That's an option that this community might consider or not. Um, you know, and I think that um, there's been a lot of discussion about how do we measure success and how do we challenge success in this community. You know, we do very well on um, standardized measurements, such as the ones that you see in US News and World Report and Boston.com. Is that how we want to um, measure ourselves or are there other things that we should look at and think about? you know, perhaps relative to skills that we should include in this report card. You know, other districts, um, Needham being one of them, publishes a, a beautiful report card that gives lots of data and lots of information about, you know, what they're working on, what they're doing well, and where they're going every year. Um, we don't have that, and that might be something that we want to create, and it would be the community that we need to come together and say, these are the things that matter to us that we want to kind of highlight and collect data or information on um, and measure success moving forward. That's not a student report card. That's no. like a no. I thought so too at first. Yes. But so, it, and that would be different from the school's improvement plan. It would be like a district improvement plan. Well, it would kind of be like the the, the um, action plan. Yeah, it's kind of the report card of here. Here were our goals, mm -hmm. and we met them, and we know this is how we met them, and we're going to share that with all of you. Well, that's an interesting topic for the communication. For committee folks to think about and yeah. noodle on. But, but as you think about like the strategic plan, big mm -hmm. kind of lofty goals, the five big bucket areas, and then those broken down right. into like 10 subsets of goals. And then those all have kind of elements or indicators within them. We have, we did an action plan report, although it was Again, you know, the time is everything. We didn't, we weren't able to spend a ton of time, but I did go through that with you guys last year, kind of talking about what progress have we made in the strategic plan. I don't see it uh, as entirely different than that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was kind of asked. It sounds very similar. Yeah. Right. But, but it's a great question. And how do we know, you know, how do we know that, um, that our students are engaged citizens? Well, we know they do community service, but but how do we know they're engaged citizens? Is there a way to still maintain your standards uh, from your classes, but incorporate some kind of uh, uh, further incorporation, because I know they already do it, maybe further incorporation of kind of the citizenship 
requirement within our existing classes without watering down or or taking down our existing content. And I think that was kind of the gist of what they learned is that to just stand and deliver the information is really the antiquated approach to education. Mm -hmm. There is a place for it. There are some things that have to be memorized. It's that simple. You just have to memorize them. But our students told us, you know, as my mother would say from the mouths of babes, our students told us their best learning takes place when they feel as if they're engaged in something that matters to them, that's real, and when they have relationships with their teachers, really caring relationships. Like, I care about this person, so out of respect for this person, I'm going to put a full effort in. Yeah. They told us that. This kind of stuff, um, I think, if you ask the kids, and you explain what we mean by these things, I think the kids would tell us, yeah, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Maybe a video or something that captures that. I, I, I want to make sure I understand this, and then I have a comment about it, which is, as I see the strategic plan, that is much more all-encompassing, and it's what we want to, it's how we envision our district. And this is much more individual student based and this is how I sort of envision each kid as they graduate sort of wearing this on top of their um, mortarboard we you know don't. what I mean I think tattoos yeah and the comment <laughs> if I'm correct about this and the comment I want to say is having two kids Jesus one of them graduated from college having two kids having gone through the system and know what they looked like as compared to what their peers looked like and what they learned at DS that their peers did not learn at their high schools. But there was nothing when when they went through the system that was this formulated, this, and I think this is wonderful because I think it helps the students also distinguish themselves as they walk out of here. As opposed to leaving it to chance. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of it does happen, yeah. I agree. Yeah. It just happens. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is a wonderful, in addition to an education, it's a wonderful gift to give our students because they, when they walk out, hopefully they'll feel like they are these things and can use that, you know, as a sort of jumping off point. So I think it's, I just mold over but does that make sense? Am I thinking right, right about... So the strategic plan covers everything from resources to yeah. uh, safety. This is teaching and learning with the kid and, and what skills they need to... It really falls under that category, category primarily. How we, how we want our students to look when, when we're ready to send them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah? No? no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lynn, did you want to add anything? No, I mean, my, I, out of curiosity, because I'm looking at critical thinker up top here, and I'm trying to look at this critically. I was curious to, as to what competencies were not included in this. Because near as I can tell, everything, anytime I try to think up something, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's in collaboration. Yeah, so, and that's or, kind of why some of them ended up being uh, dual words. Um, so there was 16 that were offered out to the community. The good news is 2,423 people looked at the survey. 612 actually finished it. Um, but um, a lot of them were folded in here. I don't think anything was left out, and things that potentially would have been left out, like being, um, you know, a healthy individual or empathetic. Again, you know, it's represented in here in other ways, whether it's through the heart or through the child or through the grass, um, perhaps not just through a word. Um, but lots of things like adaptability, um, um, perseverance, problem solving, resilience. You know, they kind of all fall under one of these umbrellas. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, we look forward to um, sort of the PR and the collecting more sort of feedback. Anything that involves a panel discussion or opportunity for the community to ask questions like these would be really welcomed. Okay. And while I don't think it's necessary in terms of you guys using this, um, it would be fabulous if at a future joint committee meeting we are able to affirmatively tell you that we've really heard all the feedback and also once we've heard from constituents we would love it if we had the opportunity to to say yes we're a go okay so we'd like constituents to report out to you at a joint meeting and that would be we'll awesome okay. we, sure. we have a couple of joint meetings in october october yeah. maybe report out the first one if possible yeah. and then 
further discussion than that. Than that. Well, what would or be we great, can... even if we just waited until you guys kind of go on this, do this PR stuff. We mm -hmm. do some panel discussions, maybe make a video, maybe do whatever it seems like the best way to get the community informed about where we're going. And then at the meeting that we have as a joint committee, you could be sharing what we did to go out to the community and then asking, does that make so you're sense? Like, you're not asking for feedback from the Academic Innovation Committee constituencies, you want the big community constituencies. I feel like yes to both, like, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah, all right, okay. so I just kind of, Andrew and I were looking right. for the go ahead, you can start to advertise this and publicize this. Yeah, that it's a work in progress and that, you know, like we're getting feedback and also sharing information about it, I, I think, does that make sense? Yeah. This is a close to final draft is, kind of thing. And, and I think we can say that we're really close to wrapping up this work. We'd like feedback. Mm -hmm. Watch this video. Give us, you know, does it do this? Does it do that? Is there anything that we're missing? Okay. And in that process, explaining exactly why we have it. Yes, that'd be fantastic. All right. And make sure, you, sorry, no. you include everything you've already done because you've done so much and you don't want to. Yeah. You have to go back through busy work yes. and re Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before we move on from you, I just wanted to say that the leadership retreat information that you put in the report was great. It sounds like that was a worthwhile day and time. I can see some people nodding. Um, and um, I was particularly interested that you invited our, our students to come and speak. Um, and I'm curious, um, from you or from John or Stephen, um, what was their reaction of the faculty to the, or the leadership group to the students? Um, what was the reaction people, from who? From, from the leadership the group, from hearing the kids. Oh, it was, was it impactful? Oh, absolutely. I think it was, it was the, the most crux. Impactful. Yeah, it was the crux of what we did in, the, in that those two days. Absolutely. And so as a result of that, my opening day uh, remarks to the faculty pointed to a couple key focus areas, and one was, and I referenced it, the relationships. And we had a little video clip that showed some inspiration of a reluctant learner, and it was interesting because it came from Edutopia, and, and they were interviewing kids from different schools, and one kid said, you know, even if I don't particularly love that subject matter. I do work very hard for that teacher if I feel as though there's a connection and a relationship. And I thought that was really powerful. Thanks. So yeah, it was great. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Superintendent Keo, your yes. your yes. Um, so um, in my report, well, you you really heard about the opening of school mm -hmm. in our last uh, at the joint meeting. So I'm gonna kind of move on from that. Other than to say things are still going very well, so we're happy about that and settling in. Um, I also included in my report our new hire information. So um, I think it's tempting to look at that and think, my goodness, we. I didn't. I don't remember seeing all those positions in the budget, and um, so I made sure to note that uh, many of these are either from a reconfigured position or um, a replacement person. Um, we have some great, great, great hires. I I don't know that I've ever felt this good about our, um, our kind of incoming group of educators. We. That's a good mark of a, a strong system, too, because people are obviously drawn to dover Sherburn, and that's what we want to hear and see. So um, I hope you'll agree with me that uh, uh, that our candidates here are fantastic. I um, was especially thrilled uh, with our math teacher, uh, Sophie Chen, who's joining us from California. Uh, I had a great interview with her on uh, um, by way of, I guess it was Skype, and, um, or FaceTime, uh, she has such a great background, and I think she's going to be a fantastic fit for us. And that, what I liked most about her background is that she, in fact, has taught in both really challenging schools uh, where kids don't have the kinds of resources that we do here, and in school systems <coughs> similar to, to D Dover and Sherburn, where kids have much better opportunities. I think she's been able to meld those. I hope that that's holding true. But um, she, among so many, we have uh, former students in this list. I'm really excited about this group. So um, that is our uh, our kind of hires. I also included in my report our 
our uh, very, very preliminary um, enrollment figures. And uh, the reason these are considered preliminary is because the state actually requires that we give them our hard numbers on October 1st, because they know there's a lot of movement in and out of school systems. People are not settled by the start first day of school. There's still a lot of movement, um, but I can tell you, you know, even with uh, um, 46 new students in the schools at the region, we, we, we had 53 withdraw and go to other schools or move. So that's a lot of movement. But at the end of the day, you know, it's easy to say, oh my gosh, we, we, we must be bursting at the seams. Well, actually an overall increase of three students as of, mm -hmm. as of now. That's still in flux, still very pre preliminary, but that's an important consideration for us in terms of our class sizes and where we're going with our budgets. And, and um, so um, it sorts itself out. Don has said this a million times, but the enrollments seem to sort themselves out and stay fairly consistent in our system. So we obviously are watching them, but I wanted to make sure that you had that. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the, um, is the kind of the state of affairs with the Triple E. And um, I was anticipating some questions, uh, which if you didn't ask me questions, there'd be something seriously wrong. Uh, it is a concerning time for us. I think people in Massachusetts are concerned. I think most of us are trying to keep it in the proper perspective. The, um, the incidence rate of, of, uh, of, uh, of being infected in, with Triple E, human infection, is relatively low. But the consequences of that infection is incredibly serious. And so um, that's why we and other school systems across the state, but especially right in our area, Unfortunately, we are in the sweet spot. Um, other systems have taken steps, as, as have we, to adjust their athletic schedules, to move things to, uh, uh, to the afternoon. Uh, you're not seeing night football games, for example. Uh, our practices are ending as, uh, as far before um, sunset as possible. It's really post-sunset. It's really right now. This is not the time to be outside because you're now post sunset and um, you're in that dusk window. So, but we're, we're doing everything we can to kind of get the kids in and off the, um, the fields early. We are in fact having conversations and Emily can probably speak to this a little later, but she's in touch as the athletic director with all the athletic directors within the Tri-Valley. They meet on a regular basis and um, and stay in touch, I assume, more often than just the meetings when they're having discussions about, for example, track meets that came up uh, recently. And I know it's been discussed with the, the ADs. Um, we are, in fact, looking at the, um, the wisdom of having um, track practice down in the woods near the river, for example. Cross country. Yes, Yeah. cross country. So, um, and I know that um, Emily is having discussions with the coaches about that. And, and, and um, so there, there, there are steps that we're taking as the schools. The, uh, the, uh, we received some notification actually just before this meeting from the Board of Health in Dover um, that uh, they, they talk about the three main strategies to protecting yourself and your family from infection from a mosquito bite, personal protection measures, town ordered street level spraying by the Norfolk County Mosquito Control, and state or ordered or aerial spraying by the Mass Department of Public Health and the Mass Department of Agriculture. So um, simultaneous to this coming out, I received a call in Sherburn, and it's, it, it is one of the challenges, I have to admit, of being in two different counties <laughs> because um, Having two different board of health is one challenge, but being in two different counties where they're getting directions from different angles uh, complicates things. Let's just put it that way. Um, but we, you know, sometimes things are happening faster than we would prefer. It'd be nice if we could say, you know, we know that the spraying is going to happen on such and such date, but in fact, sometimes it's not that clean. Sometimes it's the state has made the decision that they are going to spray these 
regions. And the state has made the decision to do the aerial spraying and both Dover and Sherburn were on that list that was um, that came out uh, this evening. There's also then the, the um, they refer to it as the town ordered street level spraying um, that's also going on. So that's more um, around the uh, various neighborhoods and I think you've probably seen those off the back of trucks, uh, but they're not doing that everywhere. But the, but the Board of Health and the Department of Public Health people that I've spoken to continually say that is the least effective, that is the least effective measure for combating uh, triple E. And that's mainly because mosquitoes fly. They don't recognize borders. They, they bite birds and birds fly into your town. And your, the birds may have flown up from southeastern Mass where there's a higher incidence or who knows. But all of that makes this a very inexact science and that's why they go back to saying, and I will quote, the absolute most effective, nearly 100% effective in fact, strategy in pers is personal protection because you control this. The listed steps are extremely effective, the cost is low, and you know that you are protected. And the personal protection measures that they mention, DEET, 25% to 35% apply, apply to exposed skin. Noting now that the Mass DPH has published approval of the use of DEET for children older than two months in concentration of 25 to 30%. Uh, Promethean applied to clothing, usable up through five, uh, six washings kills mosquitoes on contact, alternatively oil of lemon eucalyptus, long sleeve shirts and long pants where feasible and of light colored fabric specifically for sports teams and, and avoid an hour before dusk outdoors and the several hours around dawn for outside activities. Understand that mosquitoes are highly active in damp wooded areas, particularly in deciduous trees, even in daylight. So those are kind of their their recommended protection measures. So we will continue to push that message home. I will try to get something out to the families, letting them know that we heard from the Board of Health and from the Sherburn side as well, just so that they know uh, of the spraying and of these things, these steps that are being taken by the state. Um, and But again, emphasizing the kind of personal protections are the best thing we can do. Okay. Um, you just said something about dawn and when, how long after the sun rises or when the sun appears to rise? Uh, and the several hours around dawn for outside activities. Okay, the only, that, that makes me wonder, is there something we should be telling parents about? The region, don't they get picked up at 10 after seven and I just looked up sunrise, is it 618? Mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. know, but I'm just wondering if we want to maybe think about that. As well, I, I, so. Or maybe we have, I don't know. Well, but. I mean, I think well, I've definitely thought about it because <laughs> um, people ask me to think about it. What about bus stops? Yeah. What about okay. recess? Right. What about recess on a cloudy day? Yeah. Well, you know, the sun keeps the mosquitoes away. Well, what if it's not sunny? Yeah. What about recess on a cloudy day when it's really warm and muggy? Yeah. It, and after a while, yeah. it does um, make your head spin. Yeah. Because there's so many things that, there's so many variables that you, you think you've accounted for all of yeah. them and it's pretty tough to do. Yeah. But that said, there are no nonsense, uh, like uh, no nonsense practical steps that we can be taking. I don't know that we can say, for example, everyone needs to drive their own kids to school. No, 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 no. But we certainly can share this information with yeah. people the, and, and allow and be sure that people understand that ultimately you can make decisions as a parent too about your own child for your own comfort levels. So for example, if your child is not comfortable participating in a certain sport uh, at certain times or something like that. I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe I talked to John about this and that there's, there's no consequence if a kid missed something because the parents didn't want their kid to participate because of concerns for mosquitoes. For safety, no. Right. There'd be no consequence. So 
so our 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 overall message is that you know these are uh, these are young adults. We cherish them, but we also know that you know if we were to, for example, shut down athletics, there'd be a lot of unhappy people. So somewhere in there is the balance. So we're trying to be smart about it, but also um, not uh, not uh, lose the educational experience that's so important to our kids. Um, one question I have is the, the communication that we you received um, from, the, I believe it's the Board of Health this evening, regarding that spraying and that it, it may include the property of the high school, mm -hmm. which is a change from their policy in the past because of the emergency declaration because of the AAA. You'll forward that to the community at some point in the... I will. Okay. Fabulous. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Yep. Any other questions? Um, I, I'll i just reiterate from the other night, so I'll be brief. Um, and it's partially with, you know, dad hat on and partially school committee. Um, member, um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about kids in the woods without shirts on, without insect repellent on, which is happening. Um, I'm concerned about high concentrations of kids in the woods with sleeveless shirts on when they sprayed themselves and they'll perspire that off within 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I, I know it's kind of getting into the, the, the weeds, but it's it's frightening. Um, and it seems like the uh, maybe there's a compromise of the athletic and educational experience to be running outside the woods, um, but there is a much less risky alternative available. Um, and I, I um, urge the, the uh, the high school to avail itself of that. Thank you. All right. Um, are, is that the end of your That's report? the end of my report. Thank you. Um, so, and I have two I'm questions sorry. on the oh, report. Oh, sorry. That's okay. okay. That's okay. Um, and, and certainly can cover it another time if we're running behind. I'm interested on a, maybe a little bit on grit and what that's about. So the GRIT program um, is our social emotional uh, program that we talked about putting in place in the middle school. So we have a um, an academic advisor and uh, an adjustment counsel uh, adjustment counselor associated with that program. And these are for uh, the program is really meant for kids who need additional supports, not necessarily around academics, but about navigating kind of the social. Um, social kind of emotional experience, which can be pretty complicated for middle school kids and to to kind of um, to kind of prove that point, we know when we look at our statistics, frequently the kids who we're losing as a, at the region are in fact the um, sixth and seventh grade range and eleventh uh, and twelfth uh, in, in terms of social emotional kids. So that's why the decision was made to put the GRIT program into the um, into the middle school. Actually, Stephen is uh, standing in for Scott, so he has a much better sense of it. But can you talk to the GRIT program at all, Stephen? As much as I can. It, it's brand new, uh, as you were mentioning. The um, academic advisor is a special ed teacher, Eric Lacchiato. And then the uh, student adjustment counselor is George Jenkins, who we uh, snagged from the high school. <laughs> mm. So he made the wise choice. So um, we're really excited to have both of them in there. And so it's it's a small group of students at the moment. Uh, and like Andrew was just saying, we're really trying to focus on students uh, who have social emotional challenges that they're dealing with at this time and help them build resiliency, help them you know, build the grit uh, to help them navigate some of these waters. Some kids are, are trying to figure out so many of the complicated uh, social pragmatics that they need to at this time in their development. So, and when you have a deficit in that, 
uh, it's important to help build those skills. And so the, the teachers and the adjustment counselor in there are helping students kind of scaffold these skills and build them so they can have the tools they need to be successful students and, and, uh, and successful members of our community. And, and is, is this available only for kids on IEPs? Or is it a kind of like a social emotional RTI where if there's a particular need for short term where a student um, would have that available? Sure. So, so at the moment, it is all students on IEPs. Uh, and we do have the idea that if a student did come to us with severe, you know, uh, social emotional need, um, and that this would be a program that we could put a student in in case something kind of happened, like you're saying, like a sudden kind of need arises, can we accommodate that student? And the answer at this point is yes. So we, we'd want to help that student because you know, we're here to serve the whole, whole child. And so if a kid has that, we want to help them. So in that way, it's similar to the bridge program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to be responsive and not... Um, you know, we don't want to be in a, ever be in a position where we're dealing with a kid who has these kinds of challenges and we say, well, we don't have a program for that, so we, there's not much else we can do. We, we're being more deliberate as a system. We're being more deliberate. We're being more deliberate about adding adjustment counselors at the region. We're being more deliberate about adding psychologists at the region because we can't leave these kinds of situations to chance because once they get momentum, once a person who's really struggling gains momentum with those struggles, it's it's really hard to keep them. And so this is kind of our uh, proactive measure to to serve the needs of these kids before they they start to have much bigger trouble. It's great. So Thank so you. far it's been great. And, and just yeah. a, a brief follow up, if it's did the school psychologist is is that a, the high at the high school mm -hmm. is um, that person um, a I guess a non assessment school psychologist you know, or is it they will be conducting testing, the testing and they will also be counseling students okay. they'll have a caseload so that was key to us. So we wanted both. You guys may recall when we were talking yeah. about the reorg, but we wanted both. We also wanted to take some of the pressure off of our guidance counselors who were performing sometimes more intensive counseling than would normally be expected of a guidance counselor. And we have very capable people, but it would be nice if we had others who really specialize in that, such as adjustment counselors and psychologists. So that's that, that's the increase for both middle and high school. The, um, the adjustment counselor, was assigned to this grit program. Yes. Is that, I know that other students at the middle school who are having social and emotional problems mm -hmm. have typically gone to, it was Heidi Luando for years yes. and years. Is Heidi still performing that function there? Yes. Separate and apart from the from this program? Yes, this, is, this is a new person. So George Jenkins yeah. is uh, 0.5 for the GRIT program itself, and then 0.5 for the student populace as a whole. Like Heidi, so additional so, Heidi. Yeah, so uh, Heidi's still there. Oh, so there's an extra Heidi. Yeah. Yes. yes. Ah, that's fabulous. Yeah, that yeah. That's really good. And so I assume that in his role, or, or Heidi herself, can refer in people who are not on IEPs. Yes. Oh, marvelous. Yes. Okay. And, and if I may, yeah. uh, Sharon. Um, George has experience already at the high school, so he also knows the personnel really well. He knows Heidi really well and has spent a good two years with her. So the collaboration there has not missed a beat. That's great. Yeah, it's and the energy in the great. room is really fantastic to watch when you go in. Uh, George and Eric are perfect counterbalances to each other. Eric is a little more detail oriented, and and but he's still a really fun, loving guy. And George is this big, bright ball of energy. You say, "Hey, how's it going?" Welcome the kids, and they just have this really great dynamic in that room already. It's fa it's fantastic to watch. And we have Ed assistants in there as well. We have three. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and so this, I I just I can't emphasize this strongly enough. This when we go through this budget process, when we went through that budget process and we were presenting this to you guys and we were talking about things in theory, it's now happening on the ground and it's really making a difference and it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a big difference for the system and it's going to we're going to see that impact all the way up into the high school. Yeah. 
And so, and I, I give the high school folks the credit for starting the bridge program, which was the kind of, we saw how successful that was. And I think we've learned some things. Yeah. Do these changes bring us to meeting a standard across schools or is this, are we ahead of the game on this level of support that we're providing? How does Compared it how to does, other school districts? Yeah, I mean, just is this like a typical, you know, system that's in place in in schools or so it's a great it's a great question lynn i would say we're a little behind mm -hmm. quite honestly but the, it's not for lack of concern or um, it's it's because we're so small mm -hmm. we're really really small system so if you're a school a high school say for example of 15 or 1600 kids you're going to have easy justification for multiple support programs of all different kinds, all different kinds of support programs. We we might not have those kinds of challenged, challenged kids come through, or they'll come through in pockets. But this is one area where we know consistently we've had challenges as a school system. And that's why um, we're doing it here. So um, I think we've been doing our best to meet those kids' needs, but I think this is a more uh, intentional and deliberate and proactive approach. But it has been happening in other systems, some systems longer than others. Yeah. But I do think it's where we should be. Thanks. All right, we good with Superintendent Keogh's report. All right, moving forward. Mr. 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 Sharon, do you want to have Mr. Robolowski, continue, because then I can then introduce Emily. That would be perfect. So why don't we okay, switch the order? All right. Mr. Robolowski, yes. here for Mr. Kellett. We're delighted to have you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming. Um, if you could just give us a quick update on what's what's happening at the middle school. Sure. Uh, and, and Mr. Kellett sends his apologies for not being able to be here this evening. Uh, so the year starts off with one of the best events that Scott and I both absolutely enjoy so much. It's the D1A assemblies, and these are um, guided by uh, Heather Bond and Aaron Newman and Angelo Mac Macchiano. And what's wonderful about that is that the, these two assemblies are completely student run. Um, they are crafted, they're, they're gently guided by the teachers, but they really, they're pr producing all these videos and they're introducing new students to all kind of the norms that we have here and they make uh wonderful little presentations about you know don't go in the science corridor for the high school <laughs> it's just it's really excellent and they they run two complete assemblies that assembly uh when we kind of first come in and then the assembly that ends that friday of that first week and just to see all that work done by students is really the, at the core of what we're trying to move towards as an entire district is this, the idea that student student focused student-led work it's really wonderful to watch I was going to speak about the GRID program and get to get a chance. The, the acronym stands for Growth, Resilience, Integrity, and Tenacity. Just to put that information out there again, George Jenkins is the adjustment counselor, and Eric Lacchiato is the um, student uh, special education teacher in the room. Uh, wonderful program. We're so excited about it and really uh, looking forward to uh, what it does in the future. And then, kind of the last thing I was going to touch upon uh, from the report uh, was the the um, two new innovative classrooms. So uh, room 229 and 235, we have a math classroom and a social studies classroom that uh, through the generosity of DSEF um, were able to kind of transform themselves. Uh, teachers came together and we had a workshop for the teachers where we they had they read a book um, talking about uh, educational spaces and how to kind of reimagine those spaces. And teachers got really excited and they went off and they kind of planned together and they cleaned out their rooms and uh, reimagined it from the kind of the ground up. And so really, really exciting to see um, how they're using those spaces now and, and, and how it could possibly affect, you know, what they do. They're also keeping tabs because each of those teachers also teaches a class outside of those classrooms as well. So just kind of. A, kind of a control in a way. Uh, it's not apples to, to apples always, but it, it's it's definitely a way for them to kind of see is are there differences? How do even I feel as a teacher teaching in this space versus a more traditional space that we have here at the middle school? So really excited about that. Those teachers um, are uh, Jason Criscolo and uh, Sarah Collins in the social studies department, and Tanya Milborn and Aaron Newman in the math department. 
are uh, for for that. So super super excited about that. And uh, unless there are questions, that's um, what I was going to talk about. I have a couple of questions. Please. Um, the new classrooms sounded and sounded great, both when yes. you explained it in the report. Is there any opportunity for the community, or specifically us, to get an eyeball on them, or are there pictures, or is there any chance that we could do? Oh, he, he's, yeah, there are yeah, pictures, there are pictures in, in the report. There's a newsletter that's going to come from Senate okay. Office on Friday. Yes. We'll have that. Pictures of all 14 K through 12. Mm -hmm. Mine might not have downloaded. I do my. Yeah, there's one. Um, Oh, thank you. Mine didn't. I think You're when I downloaded one. it, it didn't update. <laughs> Fantastic. Also, I think during open yeah. houses, the plan is to not only allow um, parents to visit, obviously, the, the teacher's mm -hmm. rooms of their children, but also they are going to be directed to go check out these other rooms. Yeah, which look um, great. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you. That answers that question. Um, and then one question I had is in the report, and if you can't speak to it, that's fine. If, if Ms. McCoy can. Um, there was, um, you spoke about getting an outside consultant to work with the ELA and math departments to talk about small group time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious about where's the role of, um, of Kate in that, mm -hmm. Kate McCarthy in that? Is that part of her role? What's the difference between what she could do and an outside consultant? And what, what's going on with that? Because I'm curious about it in the context of we sort of thought about that new role for, for Kate McCarthy. And maybe this is a question for you. Um, and do we need to be thinking about her capacity and budget cycle and w where are we going with the outside consultant there? Sure. So this is a continuation of the work that the middle school did last year with JC Ippolito, okay. Ippolito yep. just in terms of um, how do we develop a continuum where we have students coming up from fifth grade who are very much work, mm -hmm. work, used to a workshop model and those flexible seating spaces yep. um, and what could into the middle school um, English classroom look like and how should be approaching reading and writing. So it's really more of an academic conversation at this point. However, in the conversations with JC and his team last year, one of the problems of practice that was identified is um, the small group English and small group math mm -hmm. um, courses and is that uh, the best approach um, to providing supports for kids and is there a better way to do it? Um, and so that is kind of the question and the problem of practice they're going to be working with JC and his team on this year. So he's the consultant? Yes. Okay. So, uh, but, but Kate is going to be part of that, as are some special educators and, some, and our ELL teachers. So it's not just uh, Jenna teachers in the room having these conversations. Um, and the math department is having a similar question. They've been kind of grappling with the idea of um, retention of concepts um, from year to year, um, as well as is um, the math. I mean, you can speak to it better than me, probably. Mm -hmm. Small group math also, you know, doing what it needs to do in terms of um, developing skills and growth over time. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the, the question that we're trying to answer. How can we best utilize that time for students to develop the skills they need to be successful in math or English or whatever it is? But to your question, Maggie, mm. the it's a, and it's a really good question. It, is there a connection with kind of the director of student services, especially around the special ed piece. Are the kids who are in our smaller group classes special needs students exclusively? And if they are, is that the best and most least restrictive? Mm -hmm. Is that the most least restrictive environment for those kids? Because we do know that least restrictive is the best, and by that, the closer to their mainstream kind of uh, average typical peer, the better. So if in fact we are pulling out for these small groups, we think to ourselves intuitively, makes sense, small group, more attention, it's gonna be better, but is it? And that's where Kate comes into the equation. And I very much appreciate having Kate's perspective because she's another outside set of eyes that's also grappled with this from a whole different perspective at New mm -hmm. North and in Pembroke. And same for Naomi O'Brien at the elementary level. So these are, these are this is an ongoing discussion. It's, I think at this point, it's Kate um, kind of still getting her sea legs, mm -hmm. but she's taking it all in. She doesn't, she needs to kind of, you know, make sure she fully understands why we do what we do before she starts making recommendations. And I'm not saying it's not working because um, there are merits, uh, but I do think that it's something, and I'm not surprised that they brought that up, that they suggested that we should look at it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think the immediate question is we have some students, both um, special ed and gen ed students together in this small group. 
Um, and if we have, I mean, that's an expensive model uh, compared to other districts, and we're very excited to have that time, but are we using that time effectively? And should we be spending more time doing what we're doing in 45 minutes they have the teacher initially, or should they be doing something else? And I know that's something that, that we've talked about and um, we've consulted with other districts about. So we're hoping that these literacy experts can come in and kind of say, you know, if you have this gift of time, this is how to use it, this is how to bring special ed in or educational assistance in, you know, to really make the most out of it. Thank you. Other questions on the middle school? Um, on the innovative um, learning spaces, is there a um, a plan to expand that? Is there a plan to is 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 there enough time to measure that um, before <laughs> the next cycle? Uh, and if it is expanded, would that be an expansion through requesting further piloting from DSEF, or would it be something that would be within a capital program? So I think the first thing is collecting some, some data, data and yeah. some of it can be qualitative. A lot of it's going to be um, yes. qualitative versus quantitative. Um, so far, very positive. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm hearing about it from my own children too, mm -hmm. who come home and chit chat that they don't have social studies in that class. They're the one class that doesn't and why, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and then one of my children does have it all day. Um, but collecting some of that data and saying, you know, is this, you know, a valuable use of money and resources? And if so, what are the benefits? Um, you know, DSEF was very generous with that grant. I know they put a lot of thought and energy into whether or not that's where they wanted to kind of put the, the big allotment of money that they gave us. Um, but we showed them all the research um, that had luckily come out at the same time as the grant application process. So they got article after article after article after article about how sometimes innovation comes from instructional practices first, and sometimes it comes from changing the space and the instructional practices come later. Um, so they went with it, so far so good, but I think we need a little bit more data before we can convince either DSEF or Ms. Pettori to give us more money. <laughs> what was interesting about um, the uh, the classrooms and the work that's gone into to the classrooms under this grant was that it's very consistent with what you saw in Finland. Mm -hmm. And that to me was fascinating that they, um, so you guys went to Finland, I saw it before, so that doesn't really count, but you guys went to Finland, you had already submitted this grant and essentially purchased the furniture. That ends up looking very much like the classrooms <laughs> you ended up seeing in Finland, which I think is fascinating. So, um, but it is a pilot, correct? Yes. So we, we, you know, we have to assess as to whether or not there, um, this is gonna be expanded or not. Three quick anecdotes is there was one high school student who reported home um, that having leaving one of the innovative classroom spaces, um, she feels more kind of relaxed, um, less stressed out after that period. Um, and that was the end of the day and I forgot my other two anecdotes. So they were good, they were positive. But we have to make sure that it's all positive before we So we will, we will kind of go through that process though of assessing I can attest to that. how it's impacted. Oh, the other one was an email um, about the pictures. The pictures went out to mm. the faculty today mm. of all 14 classrooms. And one of the responses was, it's amazing how in this building, all of the other classrooms are starting to follow suit. Mm -hmm. It's like that. contagious. Yeah. yeah, they're taking just their, some of their traditional rows and forming U's and forming circles. And it's not just a one-time thing, but rather that's how they're reconfiguring their classroom. I had a teacher come to me at the elementary level and say how much it had uh, rejuvenated her. And that she was excited about kind of teaching using this kind of new setup. It was, it was awesome. Thank you. I have one quick yes. question. Um, the lunch cafe, yes. I think is such a cool idea. And is that open to only kids on IEPs or can any? Any student. Where is that? Um, it's taking place here in the library. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, uh, it's lovely. And, and any student can come. Every day. It's open every day now. Last year, we were, I think we were only able to offer it during second lunch, but uh, this year, um, through some staffing adjustments uh, with our educational assistants, we have it now first and second lunch. So I, need to I think that's great. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Sharon. So just to piggyback on what Beth and Stephen said, we have uh, three classrooms at the high school uh, that we're using the innovative classroom. And because we share classrooms, it actually means that about five or six teachers are able to engage in that process. Uh, math, a couple English classrooms, and a math classroom. And then, um, as we mentioned before, a couple other people have also just 
you know, made some modifications to their own rooms, um, which has created some excitement and some energy, which has been great. Uh, we've had a good start to our school year. Um, great group of freshmen um, at our faculty. You know, we, we sort of highlight some things that are going really well. And there was a lot of positive feedback from the incoming freshman class about, you know, type of kids they were in terms of their response to, you know, just assimilating into the high school curriculum and, and you know, making their way around. And of course, there's always some angst and, you know, where is this class or where is that class? And I have to give our peer leaders a lot of credit. It's a really strong program we have at the high school. Um, I think kids that serve on that, it's an honor. But I also think that they serve such a great uh, and valuable purpose for our school as ambassadors to our school. Um, and they're able to sort of help transition. And, and I just saw a lot of that. But uh, you know what? I also saw a lot of other students who weren't peer leaders helping one another out. Um, I had a teacher come today and report that one of our newer students um, had a different lunch that day. So some kids he had been sitting with, he didn't have them. And a group of students went over and asked him to come over to their table. Um, and once again, it just hits home with our relationships. You know, for that kid, it, it, it probably made his day or it certainly reduced his anxiety about the, the fact that, you know, you're eating alone or, you know, who's staring at me, who's not. And um, so, so that's really helpful. Um, we had our freshman activities fair, which is always really successful. Uh, it's great. Freshmen are able to learn a little bit about the clubs and activities we have. And then the club leaders are able to present. So it's actually a nice little uh, public speaking skill for them as well, uh, which is fun. And um, we this year are going to be having our arts homecoming October 4th. And all school committee members, by all means, are welcome. If it's a day that you can come by the high school, please do so. We actually send some people down to other schools as well that day. Uh, Darren Buck, who is a DS alumni uh, and a teacher, has been sort of um, orchestrating this. And he will bring in um, DS alumni who have gone on into uh, professions in the area of the arts, wide range uh, of arts, and they present, but then they also come to classrooms that they're invited by teachers, and we do a whole presentation in the library. Um, very proud day, a great day, because we're bringing back alumni, uh, but it's really positive for our students because they can see some different avenues that they can take with the arts, um, and there are many. Um, so that's something that's really positive um also just was pleased at the turnout that we had this summer for the the high school participating in uh the portrait of a graduate envisioning uh ds 2035 i thought that was great really good momentum for that and uh, as andrew had said i'm really excited about our new staff uh, jessica lutz who's our school psychologist has been fantastic it's, um, sophie chen uh, and then, of course, um, really excited to introduce to you Emily Sullivan, who's our new athletic director. Um, Emily actually came for the state lacrosse championship um, and participated in that, which was really kind and nice of her to do. And that was great where she got to meet a lot of people and um, chat a little bit and kind of see some of our um, sports in action. And she was in throughout the summer. Uh, we meet on a regular basis. She touches base with Anne as well for any student issues. Um, she does a fantastic job. If you haven't already checked out her Twitter feed, she's great. A lot of photos, a lot of information. Um, she's highly organized. She's level-headed um, and I think is going to be a fantastic athletic director for our district. So introduce Emily Sullivan. Thank you. Yes, yeah, super excited to be here. It's been a blast so far. Um, yeah, Emily, could I ask, would you mind joining us at sure. the table? Yeah. Um, and while you're sitting down, I just want to, on behalf of, the, I think, the entire school committee, um, I just wanted to say a big welcome um, that we watched the process that ha unfolded last year that led to your joining the team here, that um, we very much appreciate your um, experience. Your enthusiasm uh, as a parent of a student athlete, I have followed your Twitter feed and I agree with Mr. Smith. It's like we have a play by play and I really appreciate it um, being oftentimes at work or places where I can't see it. And um, and also in light of the challenges, the unexpected challenges of, of dealing with Tripoli, mm -hmm. um, it's it's a lot and it's mm -hmm. a big lift for a, a new person. So welcome. You have our support 
and um, please do keep in touch going forward with whatever you need from us. Absolutely. Um, so come share whatever you'd like to share. Yeah, so very excited to be here. The lacrosse uh, state tournament was a great way to start 1-0, and they played awesome, so it was a great first event to be at. But um, just to get going on kind of the report that I had with you um, all in there, our participation rate is great. We have 320 student athletes participating in a fall sport right now, so almost 50% of our students, which I think is pretty normal for DS. This is um, all in line with what has happened in the past. Um, you can see the breakdown by sport in there. Cross country obviously being our largest with about 110 student athletes, 59 girls, 51 boys I think is what the breakdown is. At each level, cross country is varsity only. Um, football, JV and varsity, boys soccer, football, uh, varsity for boys soccer, varsity, JV and JV2 girls soccer, varsity and JV, field hockey, varsity and JV, and golf, varsity and JV. So about two levels at every sport other than boys soccer. So the participation has been great. Um, went overall in the last week of games. It's been fantastic. Not that wins and losses is the only way we measure it all, but it certainly doesn't hurt when you're winning. And um, the varsity teams in the last 10 days have compiled about including today about a 10 and two record uh golf just texted me they won as well so um 11 and two and one maybe today so varsity teams are doing really great as are jv and jv2 teams overall the coaches are working really hard the kids are working even harder they're really excited about the fall i think it's going to be a really really great season um competitively we've done really well to go off of Dr. Keo's Triple E, that's obviously been a big part of um, the athletics so far. It started probably with Ashland. Almost our entire league is in this curfew of 6 p.m. or 30 minutes before sunset. I think the only school that's not right now is Dedham, and they're shortly probably going to be in there too. So everyone's hoping for the first freeze, obviously. But we talk every day. We're always emailing about what are you guys doing all of a sudden we started talking about bug spray are you guys providing it in the past no one has so now we are putting bug spray in all of our med kits that are 30 percent deed or less so we have all of those in our med kits of all of our sports practice is pretty much done by 4 30 or 5 every day so it's a good chunk of time before the sun sets for practice games we move varsity games up to be played first traditionally they were played second so varsity games are at 3.30 approximately. JV games are after, and they have been compromised a little bit. You know, for soccer today, we played 30-minute halves instead of 35-minute halves to get them in in time. So those are kind of the different things we're doing to take precaution um, from a logistical standpoint, day-to-day -day practices. Anything on the turf, I'm out there every day, and it really has been... Um, pretty bug free every single day the turf is really not our main concern it's when we're going out to farm street or the upper fields or the field hockey field right behind there and um, obviously our cross country team is our most concern of all of our sports um, hearing that about the t-shirts that's something i'll talk to the team about tomorrow because no one's supposed to have their shirt off it's <coughs> one of our school rules so um, that was implemented i think a couple years ago so everyone's supposed to be running with clothes on the sport, I've seen a lot of student athletes with long sleeves on um, using the bug spray. Most of the students have packed their own, um, but we do have it on our in our med kits as well to provide that. I've talked specifically to the cross country coaches because that is our most concern of all of our sports. Um, they haven't had a meet yet. They're away for the first meet tomorrow at Medway. Their course is mostly flat outside, not in the woods. So that's not too much of a concern. We don't host until the 25th of September. So once we host, we're going to have to start um, making sure everything's okay because it's probably not going to be a first freeze by that point in the fall. But day-to-day -day with them running, we've talked a lot about using alternate courses. Um, today, for example, they were using the soccer fields, Farm Street, um, all the way around and not using the woods at all. The coaches have been very proactive in determining the weather. So today they noticed it was cloudy. It was a little buggier outside than it normally is on a windy day. And so they were running in open areas um, away from the woods. 
on windier days, they've gone in the woods a little more and they've noticed it hasn't been buggy at all. So I think they're really taking into account their surroundings and the day to day, checking the weather, checking the sunset, checking, you know, if it's cloudy, the humidity, all of those things. So that is of our utmost concern right now is rescheduling to accommodate for Tripoli. Um, and the league is all pretty much on board. I mean, everyone is in the same boat of moving football games to Saturday or bumping them up. All game, most towns have a strict 6 p.m. cutoff. Ours is 30 minutes before sunset. So right now we have a little more wiggle room than they do. But as it gets, the sunset gets two minutes shorter each day. So come end of September, that'll be before six. So these are things that we're um, working on every single day. Other than Triple E, I think we have our Boosters Triathlon this Sunday, and all the fall teams are going to be there to volunteer. They're all really excited for that. I'm excited to be there, and I've heard it's a great event, so it'll be really fun to be a part of. So I think that's about it. We've had, you know, it's been, it really has been a great fall. We have Luke Fielding, one of our football players, is up for Player of the Week for DS, um, which was really exciting to see. I'm going to start doing bringing back that Raider newsletter that Jeff Parcells brought in, because I know a lot of people have really enjoyed that. So going to keep that going just to keep everyone updated on all of DS Athletics. So, Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Um, two things. Um, one, my student athlete mm -hmm. says that you are killing the Twitter game. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's felt good. That that's the so my last school didn't have a Twitter, so when I heard it was a thing here, I was so excited. It sounds like yeah. you've got it nailed. Yeah, oh, that's praise. good. Yeah, high, high praise, yeah. Um, what areas do you see moving forward that need to be focused on? Um, you know, any improvements just in general? Um, what are your concerns about sort of the athletics program overall? I think overall, I... I think it's in really good shape to me. I mean, I've been a bit spoiled in this fall season. We have a great group of coaches that have really helped me, um, and I have really good support there. I would say overall just evaluating coaches throughout all three seasons and making sure they're the best fit for our programs, which I think most are. Um, I don't have any concerns in the fall, but I would say throughout the whole year that would be one concern maybe that I have of just evaluating and making sure that we have the best um, – coaches and role models for our student athletes to learn from. So that would be one of the main things that I would be focusing on this year. Um, and then I think, I don't know if it's ever been done here at DS, but something that I would like to get more involved in just to get um, my student athlete involvement for myself and to work with the captains, um, do some sort of captain mentorship of once a month, maybe meet weekly, um, before school, after school, during that after school help, I've been able to mentor captains and try to help them improve their leadership skills. But to be honest, it's been a really great group of people that I've worked with so far. So there's not um, a ton that I see that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Yeah. Um, I just uh, applaud the the one page you're on. I forget exactly what it was called. Keys to success, or which mm. was was yeah yeah the let off meeting. with if you're yep. five minutes right yes. you're not five minutes early you're late. But I had mm -hmm. really nice kind of practical uh, tips for for success that are are fairly easy to accomplish. Right. Yeah. I think in how it starts is being on time. So that's just, I grew up in a football family and that was just kind of always reiterated in um, in our house and when we were on the court or at, in the classroom. So I think that's just the easiest way to start. If you're on time, then you can do the rest of those things. I felt bad for the people that came into that <laughs> late as they came in. That would have been <laughs> And there were some. Lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Do Dover's not known for, and Sherver are not known for their most punctual <laughs> adult attendees. Yeah. So I thought it was just fabulous. Should have, should have maybe given that a little time to roll that out. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, we'll perfect. have to start right at the beginning. Right the first day. <laughs> I did give a two minute warning. I was like, all right, it's time to go. Um, any other questions? I do want to, before closing, um, and say thank you again, and also specifically for that back-to-school sports night, the parents' night that you host, you really did an excellent job of 
handling the um we had like a little AV, uh, AV snafu mm -hmm. and I was terribly impressed with your ability okay. to captivate the room without any amplification uh, I appreciate and it you were delightful so <laughs> well, thank, thank you yeah in athletics I think with the triple e and something like that you yeah. just always have to roll yeah. with it and just be ready for anything to come your way so I appreciate it no problem it was it was it was noticed so thank, thank you. you thank and, you um, we're, we appreciate your patience staying, sticking with us oh, yeah. tonight no, as well. Oh, good. All right. Um, yep. Thanks, Emily. You, mm -hmm. didn't, you were done, John? Yep. Great. Um, so we are moving on to financial reports. Don. Okay. Don. Can I make myself? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'll be brief because basically what you have is an executive summary of what was presented in June. There weren't a lot of changes to the financials once we closed um, the book. So um, I think I laid out for you sort of the highlights. I won't walk through them. Um, does anyone have any questions on sort of what was um, summarized? I think the one addition you can look at on your um, general fund revenue statement is I did summarize for you at the bottom all the additional uses of EMD just to mm -hmm. keep that in your memory because we did have quite a few. It was an active year um, on the uses of uh, your excess and deficiency. And, and just one one question on that. The, the transportation funds, is that fiscal year on, under the, the – Additional uses of END. Right. So is, was that fiscal year 19, or is that so this we? Year? So the the committee in June voted to um, transfer from the operating fund $277,400 to the regional transportation fund that came out of sort of END. But and and that's for so going it's sitting, forward. It's sitting in your um, regional transportation reimbursement fund for fiscal year 20. And Michael, so what we will do then is our first $277,000 of bus invoices Come will go here. against the regional transportation fund, which then frees up money in your fiscal year 20 budget that we will apply to your capital needs or we um, OPEB funding. So we, it's a way to sort of manage the, keep the funds within um, the district, but to be used towards things that we discussed with the two finance groups. So that this year, um, the $300,000 of capital, we funded the capital needs of the, of the region through use of E&D because we did a similar thing with transportation the previous year. So we did not ask the funds for, the, ask the towns for any funds for capital for fiscal year 20. And then the, does that generally the is it the chapter 71 money coming in that is generally that's then used for Typically, those other so the why timing we're doing the, it's a it's a oh it's a, a path that we have to sort of use money it's mainly coming because we have other operating um, surpluses so this year it was the unexpected health care mm -hmm. savings so we'd already we already knew that. We were going to use money from the previous year's regional transportation for capital. So had that all been all we did, we wouldn't do this again. Right. But this year we had the unexpected health care savings of about 300000 So we did it a second time um, to, complete, to make things more confusing. But so that was a way for us to say, okay, here's money set aside that we already know we can use for fiscal year 21 capital. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Any other questions on finances? Um, so you also have the um, your summary of your revolving and special revenue funds. Mm -hmm. um, I, we didn't do a report for fiscal year 20 operating because we are sort of new. We just started we just did our first payroll, mm -hmm. so we will have a complete update of where we stand to date um, at your October meeting. I can let you know there's no unexpected um, things that, that came over the summer. Our chapter 70 is about where we um, thought it was going to be. We used remember that. The, governor's numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the one number where we are seeing a little bit of uptick is going to be in Chapter 71. Mm -hmm. If you followed sort of the governor's, um, the final budgets, they're looking at closer to 80% reimbursement for transportation. Um, the cherry sheet's probably closer to like the low 70s. So we are expecting to see um, a little bit more revenue come in on Chapter 71 than we had anticipated. Uh, and that's excellent news um, for all the regional districts that they are trying to, to get closer to the, the mandate of 100% funding for transportation. So 
just in my time here, I've seen it go from um, 70 almost all the way to 80. So I think that's huge improvement, and I applaud our legislators for continuing to mm -hmm. push that. The other number, and it doesn't indirectly impact um, the region, but definitely your two towns, is Circuit Breaker is almost going to be fully funded. They're really close to having that at 75 percent which again, that's been all over the board if you follow that number. So mm -hmm. there has been a lot of headway in, in the education funding and mm -hmm. what's um, available for districts. So that's good news on the state front. Looking at the news and the sort of the action of the state house in terms of the fund our future and all of the things, are we expecting any differentials coming that way or is that all coming through these reimbursement funds? Um, so we're seeing that you see what they're trying to do is build so the foundation mm -hmm. budget, right? So we will see a little bit of that, but we're not a district that's in need. So we're not seeing, we're seeing the bare minimum mm -hmm. of that versus some of the other districts. Mm -hmm. It's a huge impact Absolutely. for them because there's so much of their education that's funded by chapter mm -hmm. um, 70. Um, as you know, ours is a really small piece of what's funded. Mm -hmm. So, but that's good news for the other districts right. to bring up their level of education. Any other questions? Don, can I ask? Um, sure. We very much appreciated last year the use of E and D for capital towards the FY20 budget. I see that we're still at a fairly high percentage, close to the five percent mass on E and D. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan this year, or has thought been given to doing something similar? I think we know that at least on Sherman Advisory, we, we would sort of like to see that that percentage a little bit lower. Than Absolutely. Five. So, is, yeah. is that something that's we, we definitely know that we have some room in our E&D to apply more or, le you know, more either we'd rather do it to capital versus right. playing around with the operating budget because that's a slippery slope. Um, but definitely we also know we have higher capital needs coming. Um, and so this is going to give us a little bit more of a contribution to put towards that and less that we have to ask for the town. So there's, there's definitely when so we start getting our numbers, um, and I still think we're a year or two away from the really big numbers per capita, that that's that's an opportunity for us to um, utilize that money for that those one-time um, purchases. That's like roofs, right? Yes. Yes. Two roofs. Yep. Yeah. Well, better to replace the roof before it falls in. Exactly. For sure. And I'll have some ex some other um, sort of exciting things. We're working with a couple different groups on. Um, on a couple different areas that I'll have more complete reports for in October. Thank you. Can I just ask also on the revolving funds, um, what is the plan? There are some substantial, you know, on the transportation in particular, is there a plan this year for similar? Um, so that transportation funding? will do the same as we did last, it's an in and out. So that has to be used um, in the year that, you know, in the, within a year. So we will use the first, our, our bus invoices for the first couple of months will go against that one and we'll deplete it. Okay. And some of these, like the cafeteria, why is that so high? Is that just... So, um, except for you, yeah. you get your next report because we did purchase, made a large capital purchase out of um, the food service. Um, so we use, we build that, that fund balance had not always been that high. So we've worked really hard to sort of build up a fund balance so that we can start um, taking care of some of the capital needs of the cafeteria with its operations versus having to um, ask the towns for that. So we just, the school committee in June um, approved, I believe it was almost $60,000 worth of new serving counters that didn't have to go to the towns for funding. We were able, that will come out of that fund balance that you're looking at right now as of June 30th. And then just one final question on the um, the miscellaneous donations. Mm -hmm. It looks to me, if I'm understanding this correctly, like there's a lot of balance. It's you know that the money just was not expended last year. Is that am I interpreting this? Correctly? Well, some of them are carried forward. Like there's the dugout money that we're still waiting to see. I mean, that was a specific gift given for dugout, so we have to use that for the purpose that it was given. Um, Mudge is we got a lot. We got a large gift at the end of the year, but we've already expended that. So again, you'll see some movement on those. Um, and some we just wait till there's the right opportunity. There's nothing that says we have to, we can't hold on to some of those funds. So we've had, we've depleted several of them because we've reached out to the groups that actually 
um, it was restricted for. But at the same time, it's nice to have some of those emergency funds when things come up that we don't have in our operating budget that we have another place to go to. So we'd hate to just use it to get rid of it. And we like to hold it, make sure we're using it for something that we really need. Any further questions? Okay. Um, we need to um, approve the consent agenda. It includes um, an approval of our minutes from June 11th and also the field trips that are in the packet. Um, are there any questions on the consent agenda? I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, to ask a question. It's okay. The chili trip. Yep. Is it? I. Is it a? Is it a trip like they do like to, to the Galapagos or wherever other? Or is it a program like the China program? It, it's more like our China exchange. Um, to give you a little background, so last year we had some students from Chile right. come visit us and some teachers and they stayed with us and they're coming back again this fall and then this would be next spring we would send some students to the to, same school to that school so it's a relationship similar to china uh -huh. um, where they would do some sightseeing but also have a cultural exchange with um, a high school in chile Mm -hmm. um, so it is different from the Galapagos where yeah, they're just those are, it's more of an eco tour. Right. This is, um, they're staying with host families. Yeah. So this is like the China program, but shorter. Yeah, exactly. So, and why Chile as opposed to any other Spanish speaking country? Yeah. So, uh, Maria Lascaris, the, the educator, somebody had reached out to her, um, and had asked, you know, if she had some interest. We, we've had, in the past, we have had students um, do stopovers on the way to the Galapagos, have gone to Peru, they've gone to Chile. Um, she had this program that reached out to her and they had expressed some interest. And so that's why, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, Spain or Argentina or, yeah. you know. Did I hear it spun off of a, a, one of those more traditional trips, John, at all? Well, is that where the contacts were made? Some know? of the contacts were made there, yes, mm -hmm. with Mr. Esterbrook, um, right. the, uh, one of our Galapagos trips. But then there's an, there's an organization uh, that does that. So, um, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's great. And the you other. Know, it fits in with our global competency yeah. piece, which we like. Um, the schools and the people, they're vetted the same way that we do with China. Um, it's so interesting because each year um, I have different schools. Last year uh, I had some educators from Tanzania come and visit us, and that was fantastic. So we sometimes have these opportunities. I'm actually in discussions with a gentleman from Morocco who is uh, doing some work with establishing schools, uh, American schools there, and would love to kind of you know get some sense from us. And then, you know, down the road, it could lead yeah. to a proposal where we do an exchange. Um, oh. It's in the infancy stages, but we're we're always kind of looking at these opportunities as, as a great way to, you know, expand our own horizons and give our kids, yeah, the engaged citizens. These are putting dots on the map. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's exciting. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I know Maria is very excited about it. And then depending upon the number of kids, we also have uh, David Gomez would go as a second chaperone. So we have another. That sounds bad. Native speaker. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, any other questions on consent agenda? May I entertain a motion to accept the contents of the consent? That's it, right? Accept the contents of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? All. Okay. Fantastic. Um, moving on to number six, um, just in terms of communications, just to point out in your packets, um, the updated 1920 school committee meeting schedule. Um, and just for members and anyone else in the interested studio audience, um, that our next month meeting um, due to the holiday of Yom Kippur will be um, held on Monday, October 7th, um, and that we will begin at 5.30 p.m. Um, for some reason. 
Um, Dover has a Tommy. Either. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I knew there was a reason. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Um, so as not oh as, so as not to conflict with the annual town meeting of Dover, the special meeting to special vote on the Carroll School. Mm-hmm. So we will be wrapping this up in time for those of us who need to attend our town meeting to discuss the community center to be doing that. Um, for those of us, all of us, um, whatever subcommittees that we are assigned to, um, just looking at those and thinking about we're going to start a subcommittee section in the meetings. Not that we each have to report on all of our committees, but just to pay attention to if there is anything to update, having a committee update section of the meeting, and to please share that, um, what you need to share with Anne um, or myself before the week or so before the meeting. Um, I just draw your attention to the minutes of both the Dover and the Sherburne School Committee from May. Um, and then thinking forward to October 7th, um, just, Don, thinking about the OPEB, whether or not we need to do some work on um, meeting with OPEB um, and the policy subcommittee needing to sort of kick into gear. Um, well, the finance related yes. subcommittees I'll be reaching out to both capital um, and the OPEB. Fabulous. All right. Thank you. And um, with that, I think we are ready for adjournment. So may I take a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Judy. Second. Kate Potter, thank you. And all in favor? Fantastic. See you next month.